Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Shapford. I am uh, the Deputy Chief Executive for Communications at the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority. Uh, welcome to this morning's session on insurance. Um, before we get started uh, and I introduce you to the panel and how we're going to do um, today's session, I'd like to acknowledge um, the challenges that um, I, I would guess most or all of you have faced through the incredible um, experiences of the last two years. Uh, unprecedented, personally challenging, demanding, and for many, many people, um, the experience has been found to be so very, very difficult that it's difficult to move on. So the purpose of today's session is to try and provide some answers for you about uh, about insurance, um, but also about the rebuild so that you can move on. Um, what I would ask though around insurance is that in reality it is quite specific to you and your individual circumstances. So we're very lucky today that we've got representatives from uh, all the major insurers here and uh, I would encourage you whilst we're going to have some questions and answers and we can talk generally about your claim and your circumstances, it really really is good if as a result of this, um, we'll have people available straight away to take you to your insurer, to the area, so that you can talk further about um, those issues. Uh, and the other thing, this is an opportunity for others here who may not know the way forward to get some better understanding. So I would um, ask that you allow people um, to ask questions and we'll, we will share the microphone around so that everybody can hear the question that is going to be answered. Um, what I'll do now is I'll introduce the panel and then just talk through the format that we'll go through for this morning's session. Um, I'd like to welcome Renee Walker. Um, she uh, is representing IAG. Um, we have John Beckett um, representing Lumley. We've got John McSweeney from Southern Response and David Ash from Tower. Now, uh, if your insurer is not represented here this morning, that's okay. They will be able to talk gen generally um, from an insurance-wide perspective and then we'll make sure that we've got some helpers who'll take you off to the stand for your insurer. Um, okay, so I've got um, seven questions that I'll start things off and I'll ask directly to the panel. Um, we've gathered these questions from the community. Um, we've got them from uh, residents, leaders groups, um, from CanCern and from others to see what are the common issues that people are facing. So I thought it would be very good if we start with that process and then once we've got through some of those, uh, we'll open it up to you on the floor for your questions. When um, we come to question time, if you could put your hand up clearly and we'll get one of the people to come round with a microphone so that everybody can hear. Um, if you could direct the questions through to me and then I'll pass it off to uh, one of the insurance, insurers to answer. All right, so let's get underway. Um, the first question that's uh, commonly asked is um, who will fix my damaged land? So I'd like to ask Renee to talk a little bit about that if that's okay. Okay, so insurers insure your house, your dwelling, and EQC insures your land. EQC are currently working through their land assessments from east to west, and land payments have started in small numbers but are due to begin in bigger numbers. The EQC stand is here just down this aisle, and if you have a specific question about land, it would probably be good to go there and ask them. But from an insurance point of view, insurers are keen to keep things moving, so in most cases we want won't allow a land issue to slow down our repair or rebuild of your home. So from an IAG perspective, we would work with EQC if we're ready to repair and we need to understand what your land payment or strategy will be, we'll work with them to understand that and keep your claim moving. So insurers are working with EQC, but EQC is responsible for the payment for your land damage. Um, Renee, that's great. Could you also clarify uh, um, under cap, over cap? Yep, so insurers are responsible for repairing or rebuilding your home if your claim is over the, the EQC cap, and typically for most people that will be $100,000 plus GST. So if you've received an overcap payment, your insurer will be responsible. If you haven't received an overcap payment, so your undercap either from a single event or across events from apportionment, then EQC will be responsible for repairing your damage. 
Okay, so uh, if I get this right, so there's three components to insurance. Um, there's an a component around land, um, there's one around property, uh, and there's a component around contents. So those are the three parts to insurability. Um, insurers look after, the private insurers as we call them, look after your house and your contents. Contents over $20,000. Exactly. So AQC are responsible for contents up to $20,000 and then your private insurer is responsible from there. Okay, so th I think that's a good start for us, just making sure who you go and talk to for what. Uh, under $100,000 EQC, under $20,000 for contents EQC, over that amount, uh, it's your private insurer. Okay, great. Right, thank you very much. Um, now, there's been a lot of questions around the technical categories um, and whether or not they have slowed down the rebuild. And I'll ask John McS McSweeney from uh, Southern Response to talk about that. Thanks, Mike. The, uh, the purpose of the TC3 categories that was um, announced for, for Canterbury was intended to speed up the process rather than slow it down. Um, Prior to the announcement of the technical categories in Canterbury, uh, the, the testing for a new house that was built on flat land was very minimal. Um, seeing there were such a large number of houses in Canterbury on the flat land that had to be rebuilt uh, or have major foundation repairs, the uh, technical categories were introduced in broad form to give an indication of the type of geotechnical testing that was needed. Now, if, if that wasn't done, there was simply not enough, wasn't enough equipment available to be brought into New Zealand to undertake the amount of drilling and testing that was needed. And then on top of that, which is very important, is all the behind the scenes analysis that needs to be done. Now, that work is very, very specialised. You need very specialised and highly qualified technical engineers to analyse the core data that comes out of the ground and that's what takes a lot of the time, in fact longer than the drilling. And once that data has been analysed then the uh, structural engineer can design a suitable type of foundation knowing what the ground conditions are like. Now this means that with the technical categories um, not all of the sites that need a new house need to be physically drilled. A reasonable number do, particularly in TC3, that's where a, a detailed analysis needs to be done, but for TC2 and TC1, then the level of in-depth invasive testing is much more, uh, can be much more limited and allows uh, the overall build programme in Canterbury and that foundation design to be uh, done a lot more quickly than it otherwise would have been. So um, could I just clarify then, um, John, so who, who, tells, who tells you the type of foundations that someone's going to need for the, within these technical categories? Uh, it's the structural engineer. Once the ground has been tested, whether it's um, a relatively uh, low impact test or a core drill that needs to be done, once that comes out of the ground and is identified, then it goes to um, an engineer who analyses that uh, ground condition and once that's been done, then the engineer will design a foundation based on the type of ground that it is or the quality of that land. Great, so just to get that clear then, the technical categories tells you as the property owner and the structural engineer the types of foundations you need if you need new foundations or they need a major repair. Is that correct? Yes. Great. Um, look, I have a question for, for you then, John. So I have heard though, in TC3, so we've all heard about TC3, how it's the, the worst of, of the land and needs the best of the foundations. Um, is it possible that TC3 land can be so bad that it's not repairable or rebuildable? Uh, I think it's important to appreciate that the TC3 is a very wide, broad category and there'll be various, various qualities uh, of land within that TC3 category. The first thing with TC3 is that it's got to be tested. That's the requirement. Now, once that testing is done, some of that land is uh, very good uh, or a small enhancement to a standard foundation will be sufficient. Uh, unfortunately, in some other areas, the land is relatively poor quality or has a very high propensity for liquefaction to occur in it and a more detailed or in-depth 
foundation solution will need to be designed by the engineer when they see the quality of the land. Um, the type of foundation depends not only on the land but also on the type of house that's going to be built. Now, in Christchurch, we've tended to move towards a concrete slab with, uh, with um, summerhill stone or brick, sort of relatively heavy claddings. We'd sort of moved away from the uh, raised, uh, uh, raised wooden floors and wooden or concrete piles and weatherboard houses, which were much lighter. Now, if we continue with uh, or go back to sort of the more lighter weight constructions, it's m most of that TC3 land is going to be able to be built on. But if you want to continue with a very heavy weight structure, there could be some situations where it's really not going to be possible with the current technology. So although it's possible that some land might be um, very difficult to build on, most will be able to be, providing there's a proper sort of foundation designed and you do a, a relatively lightweight cladding and uh, rectangular or, or um, strong uh, sort of shaped house rather than uh, some of the houses that have got loads of protrusions out the side and they're not um, they're not as solid in that sort of a case. Uh, thanks very much, John. Look, I'd just like um, just to show a hands from the floor. The next question is around timelines for repairing and rebuilding. Who's frustrated here about the timelines? Hands up. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So it's th this is a common question that we know is going to be asked here. So I'm going to ask um, John uh, from Lunley just to talk through the timeline for repairing and rebuilding. Thank you. <laughs> Each insurer has obviously had to approach their, um, their, their houses in terms of when they can get them repaired in, in their own way, but most insurers have adopted an approach where vulnerable customers are at the, at the front of our program of work, then we're going to get into the properties where they need, um, you don't need quite the same amount of um, geotech research or uh, uh, reporting that you do, so for example TC3, so for example vulnerable customers followed by your TC1, TC2, and then we'll get into our TC3 and hill properties. Um, the reason that your TC3 and your hill properties will be more at the uh, middle to the back end of programs of work is just simply there's a lot more work that needs to be done around the consent process, uh, the design element, you've got to get your drilling done, you've got to get the geotech engineers to look at that, you've got to get the structural engineers to come up with a viable solutions, and then you've got to get your building capacity lined up with all of those uh, individual projects and undertaken in a, in a manageable way so that we can get customers organised to be out of their houses at the appropriate time and then back in as soon as possible. Right, thanks John. Look, um, what I'll do is I'll follow up um, and ask Renee to talk um, about, well that's good that there's a process for each of the insurers, but why does it take so long? What are the, some of the practical things that you see as insurers as to why you've got a process, but why does it take so long? And are there any ways in which um, customers can actually improve that, that process and speed? Yeah. So there's a process that all insurers will go through, and just following up from what John said, all insurers are prioritising our vulnerable customers, as AQC also is, but I know from an IAG perspective we have a number of TC3 jobs that are underway, I know that Tower and Southern Response do as well, so although vulnerable are first, those vulnerable come across all categories, so you may be a TC3 um, uninhabitable for example, and uninhabitable was a top priority for most insurers. So the process that all insurers will go through is that you'll have an assessment right at the very beginning and I hope that most of you should have had an assessment by now. You would have had an EQC assessment and once your claim is confirmed as over cap then your insurer would also do an assessment. And one of the common things we hear is I've had 10 assessments now, why do I need another one? Unfortunately because there's so many different elements you will need to have a number of assessments and these will be across your house, your foundations perhaps, if you're TC3, you'll also need to have a geotech assessment done. You'll have a land assessment from EQC. So there are a number of assessments that have to take place. 
Once you've had an assessment from your insurer, they will come back to you with your options. And so they'll talk to you about whether your house is economic to repair or not. So whether it can be repaired or whether it needs to be rebuilt. And then most insurers will have a range of options for you to settle your claim. So the top um, priority for insurers is to make sure that your house is back in the situation that it was before the earthquake. So all of us would like to see you go through the repair or rebuild process with your insurer. The reason that that is a priority is that that means that we know that you're an insurable risk at the end of the process. So if we repair or rebuild your house for you, then we're saying we know that you're an insurable risk and we'll offer you insurance at the end. If you choose one of the other settlement options, so you might choose to cash settle if that's an option that your insurer has, you may be taking the risk on yourself, so you may be deciding to cash settle on a rebuild and your insurance may be cancelled at that point until your house is rebuilt. So you really need to understand when you're looking at your settlement options what, that, what the settlement option that you choose means for your ongoing insurability. And that's something that you need to talk through with your claims case manager. So most big insurers will give you a claims manager who looks after your claim or with your insurance sales people because they'll be able to tell you what level of insurance you'll have going forward. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. But the other point that I'd just like to reinforce as well, um, if you are, um, we're going to, going to go into a difficult winter, if you are feeling you're in that vulnerable category or it is difficult in your homes now, um, come and see us afterwards. There are people here who can help with that process. We've got a new rebuild advisory service. There are a lot of people who can help with emergency repairs in your homes because we don't want people to go through uh, a cold, damp winter um, whilst these um, claims are getting sorted out. Um, what I'd like to switch on to now really is about um, new insurance. Um, and I've heard um, it said that uh, these areas, particularly TC3, we can't get insurance and insurers aren't writing new policy. So I'll ask, ask David Ash just to talk about that. Morning everyone. Um, insurability on, ongoing and particularly in TC3, um, your insurer when they manage either your repair or your rebuild, generally speaking, will be insuring you ongoing as well. So if they manage the repair or rebuild, um, it's, it's pretty much, I, th I think, reasonably certain that you'll get insurance going forward. Um, there are some sort of scenarios where if you cash out, um, and I know I'm, sp I'm speaking on Tower's behalf, um, if you cash out, we will insure you again in the future, um, as long as we get the engineering reports, once you've either repaired or rebuilt your house, um, we will definitely take you back again as well and we'll give you that guarantee. Um, Tower has recently also just brought in um, insuring new business, so people who are with other insurers in TC3, we will insure them for new builds only. So those existing builds there, we, we're not insuring those, but we will take on new business in TC3 for new builds, uh, and that was pretty much anything built from last year. So we will take that on, and look, I, I think the market will slowly open up, and I think full insurance will be available again in TC3 sometime in the near future. Great, thanks David. Um, the other one is around flooding, because we've, we've all known here in, in Greater Christchurch um, that it was always prone to flooding. Uh, I'm just interested about how insurers treat flooding. So I think I'll ask John McSweeney to talk about that. Thanks, Mike. Um, <coughs> if, you, if you're having a uh, repair or particularly a new build done, it will be compliant with the current flood levels that have been set by the Christchurch City Council. So there will be no issue there. Uh, as far as existing houses go that might have had a, a repair uh, but didn't have to be raised to the new current flood levels, um, I can't speak specifically because Southern Response is not an insurer going forward. Southern Response is only um, charged with settling the current earthquake claims from the old AMI insurance. But uh, from my understanding, at this stage, no insurer has put a blanket restriction on houses uh, that, are in, that have not been raised to the new flood levels. And this sort of thing happens quite regularly, and even if we had not had the earthquake, the new flood level requirements that were introduced by the City Council would have applied across Christchurch anyway. Now, that doesn't immediately make houses uninsurable. Uh, most insurers do continue to insure houses, but you do need to be aware that if your particular house, for whatever reason, does have continual flood issues, 
Um, you know, in the past, it has been ca there have been cases where every second year a house floods. To, unless some protective works are done, then your insurer will put a restriction on, uh, whether it is a, an exclusion to not cover flood damage any longer, or a very high excess, and in extreme cases, uh, it could be that insurance is refused. But that is a rare, a, a rare occasion, and uh, I'm not aware that that's intended to be happening uh, in Christchurch currently. Right, thank you very much. Um, one last question for the panel before I um, throw it open. It's about future insurance. Um, we, we've heard it's all changing the way in which insurance is going to happen. So I'll ask Renee just to talk a little bit about future insurance and what people need to expect as they go through this rebuild process. So as David mentioned, there are insurers taking on new policies now. So after the earthquakes for quite some time, you couldn't um, get a new policy if you didn't have an existing one. Most insurers have now opened that up. But what we will be looking for going forward is some kind of assurance that earthquake repairs or rebuilds have taken place. So what we need to be careful of as an industry is that we're not insuring someone else's total loss. So if someone has been paid out to rebuild their house, but they've been able to retain the house because it's uneconomic to repair, but it's still perfectly livable, we'll need some kind of guarantee that the earthquake repairs have been taken out. So that may be in the form of a property damage report and at the moment if we're looking at offering new insurance we're looking for a property damage report to be filled out by a builder or engineer and that quantifies the level of damage that the house has sustained or if there's if you've been paid for EQC repairs we'll be looking to see that those EQC repairs had been undertaken so if you're cash settling it's going to be particularly important that your insurer has some kind of confirmation you've undertaken the repairs you've been paid out for. So is there anywhere where there's a checklist for people to go through and know the kinds of documentation and information that they actually need to provide? I'm not sure if there is at the moment, but if there's not, we could look to get one up on the Insurance Council website because that covers all insurers. So you could quickly see what insurers are going to be looking for. But basically, it's quantifying the level of damage your house has sustained and then your insurer will decide whether they believe that's insur an insurable risk. So some damage will be an insurable risk, but if the house is at a tipping point, then the insurer may come back and say, until the damage is repaired, we don't believe it's insurable. Great. Um, thank you very much for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. I'll now open up the floor to questions. So does anybody want, want to ask a question? Yep, great. <coughs> you mentioned before that um, each property will be drilled um, for TC3 for, to find out what foundations they need. Who is responsible for that if you're under cap? If you're under cap, it's EQC. Okay. Because um, they're not doing individual drilling on properties? Yeah, so they have their drilling program, and I believe their drilling program is finished, but the best thing would probably be to speak to someone on their stand, because they'd be able to tell you whether your property will be drilled. But if your damage is under cap, they'll be responsible for the drilling and the repair of your property. So I just want, so the, but information is shared, so it may be that your property doesn't require drilling. Um, there might be results from drilling, as I understand it, nearby where they can access that information. Is that correct? Yeah. It's, it's and also it important that uh, the drilling is only needed if foundations need major repairs or replacement. Mm -hmm. If you've just got um, relatively superficial damage, particularly for an EQC under cap, you might not need any, well, you would not need drilling at all unless there's foundation repairs or rebuild, replacement of the foundation. Um, could you also tell me um, exactly how many uh, TC3 houses you've actually fixed? I'm not sure off the top of my head how many we've completed from IAG. We've got 250 in various stages of construction, but I'm not sure on the total number completed, I'm sorry. I, mean, I, I can tell you from a tower perspective. Um, we've completed one overcap repair. We've got two um, repairs underway where builders are on site, physically consents are approved, they're doing it, and we've got three rebuilds that are um, consented and they're actually in construction. Um, I think most insurers 
in the pre-construction stage in terms of design, getting the geotech and everything else done. Um, I know that we've got 120 rebuilds in TC3 that are in pre-construction um, and 170 overcap repairs in TC3 that are in pre-construction as well. So I think it has been a slow start if I'm absolutely honest about it and with TC3 we really did have a bit of a catch up with the guidelines coming out and having to get the drilling done. But um, I think you'll see for most insur all insurers TC3 will be catching up. What, what about you, complete. John McSweeney? What you um, I, I can't recall the exact number of TC3 houses that we've re rebuilt in TC3. It is on our website, though. There's a special category analysing how many in TC3. I, I must admit, it's not very many at the moment. Uh, we've completed 83 in total, and that's across all categories. Uh, but it's on our website, the actual number in TC3. Yeah, and I'd just like to add that we've... In terms of actual viable foundation solutions, it's only re relatively recently that DBH guidelines have come out with solutions that are actually going to work for TC3 property. So those are actually just guidelines. They've still got to go through a consent process. They've actually got to be built and we've actually got to break ground and actually do that. So TC3 properties have always been very complicated and as a result, we haven't been able to get in and do the repairs or the rebuilds as quickly as we would have liked. But now um, most insurers have their program of works all developed. Um, we've got our methodologies um, well mapped out and we've actually got a number of houses which are going through the consent process now which are TC3 properties and once those are built we'll be able to effectively start production for all TC3 properties. Well, that's got it. So look, I think that's something that Sarah will help with as well. We'll make sure we get the information out on our rebuild website where we can show progress. So uh, that, that's at least um, comforting that progress is starting to be made in TC3 because previously we just talked about it, um, so it seems that it's actually happening. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. On the drilling again, uh, after drilling, how long does it take for the result to come through? The results of your drilling, that is. I, I had my property drilled <laughs> last year and I still haven't heard and I've rung and no one has a result for me? Okay, in general, we would say for our customers it should take around 8 to 12 weeks after the drilling has been undertaken, but it then needs to be analysed and go to a structural engineer to design the foundations. So the initial results that come back mean very little to us, unless you're a geotechnical engineer. So they then interpret it and it goes to the structural engineer to design the foundations. Um, Coffee Geotechnical are here, so I'm not sure if everyone's walked right around, but Coffee Geotechnical are just over in that corner with one of their drilling rigs and it would probably be good to go and have a chat to them if you've got questions specifically about drilling because they can um, very clearly explain the process that they undertake but I would say between 8 to 12 weeks in general. Yeah, and, and I can add from Tower's perspective, um, Coffee do all of our drilling um, and they are taking around about three months from the time they do the drilling to get us the final report that, that indicates exactly what the ground conditions are and what's required for the structural engineer to, to go from there. And, and will the customer know they should expect to hear back on their drilling results? Well, generally, we wouldn't be um, discussing the drilling results with customers specifically. We'd be using that to go to the structural engineer to design the foundations. So the next step would be really discussing the foundations that are relevant for your home and the design of your home, rather than discussing the geotechnical results as such. That would be the same. In, in Southern Response's case, once the drilling has been done, that raw ground data is uh, obtained, but then it's not analysed until, until the customer is ready to commence the uh, rebuild, the rebuild of the new house, uh, because that's going to depend on the um, it's going to depend on the style of the house, the size of the house, and it might be um, another 12 or 18 months away before that new house has actually uh, gotten to the design stage. So it's three months before construction is due to start that the foundation design it, with the structural engineer and that report is analysed. So it's just before the construction starts for us. Thank you. Uh, my name is Darren Rooney. Um, I represent South Brighton Residents Association. Um, in our community, we have thousands of TCT, TC2 and TC3 properties that are in the flood hazard zone on land that's up to a metre lower than prior to the quakes. Um, many homeowners uh, who are repair only are concerned that 
the overcap major repairs will not result in their floor levels being raised. Uh, I know it's been touched on already, but I'm actually facilitating a floor levels workshop sometime in the next week, and it's been billed as um, how to talk to your insurance company with regard to floor levels and what questions you need to ask them. Uh, from what I ascertained so far, it seems to be the floor levels of no concern to the insurance companies, and um, if houses are not raised, then um, that liability will be passed back to the homeowners. But I would just ask, is there anything that you can offer that can be passed on to our residents um, with regard to future-proofing their homes for insurance cover? I think one of the major ones would be that they need to they need to understand their ongoing insurability before they accept a settlement option. So if we undertake the repair or rebuild, we may be undertaking it in a way that we are um, assured of the ongoing insurability. So if they need to be raised, we're making sure we do that. Whereas if we cash settle with them, that we may if they don't undertake the same repairs that we would, that could affect their ongoing insurability. So they really need to think about it before they make their settlement option choice. So making some, uh, get, becoming informed yep. and making some really um, clear decisions about cash settlement and, and the risks of, yep. of, that, of that offer. Definitely. Thank you. I, I think I can also add there that um, whenever an insurer does a, a managed repair or rebuild, they have to meet the building consent requirements and for a repair, they're going to have to meet the 1 in 50 year flood um, levels and if it requires resource consent they'll need to meet the 1 in 200 year uh, flood levels. So there is a safeguard there as well for that. I mean insurers won't be able to undertake a repair if they, if they can't get the consent. Oh, well sorry, just on that particular point it's appearing that a repair does not trigger a house being needed to be re to raised to the 50 year flood level. So that's, that's the concern. These major repairs of over 100,000 even if a house is re-leveled, it may be re-leveled to existing levels. So there's just a concern there. And, and I take on board your point that if, uh, if, if they're going to um, have a insurance managed repair, that is their safest option because you have, um, with an insurance managed repair, it will have to meet all of the code and requirements. Yeah, just, just to clarify though, any building consent has to meet that one in 50 years. So I think there's confusion around the one in 50 year uh, level and the one in 200 year level. Um, but any building consent will have to meet that one in 50. So it might be with a, a further with discussion have, afterwards. Yeah, that's with, really with council, yeah, thank you. Yep. Thanks, sir, that was great. I just wanted to ask a question about the um, future insurance. If, um, if you have repairs done by EQC and you have foundation repairs done, and um, they don't use a building consent um, because I understand that sometimes I've, I've heard that they can waiver the consent and just go ahead and fix the foundations. Yeah, it depends. Is, it does, does that mean that you know, you know in the future you're going to analyse that and you know sort of see it as a risk in terms of you know not having a building consent um, because I don't have any faith in um, the repairs that. Features are doing? Yeah. So it depends on the level of damage. If the level of damage is over a certain threshold, then they'll need a consent. If you don't need a consent for the repairs, then as long as the foundation solution was consentable at the time that it was built, we'll still consider it an insurable risk because it's still consentable. So it's only if the level of damage is over the threshold that it now needs a new consent. And you, the um, City Council are here and they've got a whole lot of people here that are talking on consents. So you could maybe speak to them about the level of damage you have and whether it would be consentable damage or not. Uh, yeah. There's not a definitive number or percentage in terms of the damage, but it appears to be that if less than 20% of your foundation is damaged, then it probably doesn't need a consent, but again, check with um, Christchurch City Council on that. Um, the other question I have is, um, they ha have said about jacking and packing piles, and in order for them to do that, they'll have to rip up, remove floors, and replace it with um, cheap jib board. So, and I have a full replacement policy, so um, what's, what are your thoughts on that? If it's under the EQC cap, then unfortunately 
whatever policy, you, your insurance policy is not relevant, so it will be EQC repairing that. But again, you'd probably best to speak to EQC about what their policy is. Under our insurance policy, if it's a feature, if your remove floors are a feature, then we replace your remove floors. If they're not a feature, so if you've got remove floorboards but they're covered over by carpet, then we would accept JIB as the solution for it because you're only going to cover it over with carpet again. So if they're a feature, they're replaced. If they're not a feature, they're not under our insurance policies. But you'd be best to speak to EQC. Doesn't that take away the option of actually using the floors later? Yeah. So if there was intention, so we've got some people that are in the middle of a renovation and they've started ripping up carpet and polishing their remove floors, then we would accept that the remove floors were going to be a feature, but the intent needs to be there. So if they were just carpeted over, then we wouldn't see the intent. But if the intent was there, then we would have a discussion around that. Yep. All right. Um, so we'll take one more question from the floor, if that's OK. Thank you. Um, we're TC3 um, over cap and with a stream boundary. We've, we've been advised from the geotech report that we needed an eight metre in-ground barrier between house and stream. Insurance, the um, EQC say, oh, well, that's making the land better, not uh, making it good. Um, not our problem. The insurance company doesn't want a bar of it, so where do we stand with our in-ground barrier? That's a... That's a it's a very specific question and uh, I think it would really be best if you spoke with your insurer if they're here today. Thank you. All right, so look, um, what I'd like to do is just quickly go um, across the panel. I just think last thoughts that for, for customers, I mean obviously frustration around getting through the process. I, I just, we'll just start with you Renee and work across about what you think um, from your company's perspective that they need to do. Any thoughts that we haven't covered? So if any of our customers are here today, so IAG represents State, NZI, ASB, BNZ and the Cooperative Bank and we're also AMI going forward. So Southern Response manages AMI earthquake claims but we are AMI insurance going forward. We have a big stand down the end and we've got plenty of staff that can talk to you about your individual concerns. But we're really focused on helping people move forward to the next stage. So we've completed 150 new houses, which doesn't sound huge, but we've got over 700 in the pipeline, and we've also got over 1,000 repairs underway. So what we can talk to you about is what happens once you're in that pipeline. I know it's frustrating to get there, but there is work happening. And as I say, we are here, and we're here so that we can answer your questions. So please come and see us if you do have a question. Great. David? Um, I'll be down at the tower stand, which is in the, the far corner at stand number eight. Um, Jason and Gordon will also be there if there's any tower customers that want to talk about their, their specific claim or, or process going forward. Um, I, I think in summary, particularly TC3, things are starting to move. It has taken a long time, but things are definitely moving. Great, thanks. John? Southern Response is here as well. We're on the main corridor, just on the left-hand side as you go down. There's a very interesting um, model of a uh, foundation design I just can't recall exactly what it is, 2A or 2B, but it's worthwhile having a look at. Concrete slab at the bottom, with reinforced steel, raised wooden piles, and then the floor on top of that. So you might like to have a look at that. If you've got any other questions, there are our representatives there. And uh, we've um, really getting underway for many of our customers now across all TC categories. And uh, we've also just published, uh, you'll see it on the stand, a very simplified version of the steps to go through once you've uh, confirmed that you wish to rebuild on your own site or a different site, the steps that you go through, a little seven step process. Great. Thank you. John. Yeah, hi, Lumley's here. We're, we've got a team of, uh, of our case managers just down this corridor, corridor here. We're also in the process of communicating with all of our customers um, to arrange appointments to come out and see each customer sit down with you and talk through where your property sits, so if it's a repair or a rebuild or other options that you might want to explore. So you would have already potentially received a letter or in the process of getting a letter followed by a phone call, an appointment um, from a, your case manager. 
So we want to keep all our customers um, informed. If you feel that isn't happening, come and see us down there. We'll take a note and we'll get your case manager to contact you as soon as possible. Great. Thank you. So all I'd like to sum up and say is this has been really frustrating and really hard. So I'm sorry about that, but I do want to hope that we can take some confidence that things can happen. We've got a whole lot of insurers, banks wanting to lend. We've got a whole lot of construction companies who can do this stuff. We've got people here who can help you with your own circumstances. And please go and ask because they can help. Don't think oh, it doesn't apply to me because it does, because everybody needs a bit of help sometime. So please ask for it. And lastly, um, thank you very much to our wonderful sign people. Um, to AV and every, all of the helpers here and to the panel, thank you very much and, and thanks to you for coming along. See you later.